All right, now um, in Psalm 94, we'll be jumping around quite a bit today, but um, I want to show you that because there's so much, there's so much Bible on the, on the topic that we're preaching on today. There's no way we're going to be able to get to all of it, but there is quite a bit that I do want to read for you. And the topic is we're going to be teaching and preaching about vengeance. Okay, and we see here in verse number one of Psalm 94, it says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. So right here up the first, in the first verse, the Bible saying that vengeance belongs unto God. And we're going to be getting into this point in just a little bit. It says, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. Now, we're going to be kind of going in depth a little bit of what is vengeance. Is it bad? Is it, is it wrong? And when is it right? When is it wrong? And um, it's an important topic that we need to understand. Just because, for one, it's talked about a lot in the Bible. And it goes hand in hand. Ultimately, vengeance goes hand in hand with judgment and justice. So you notice, you, you pay attention in a lot of the verses we go to, you know, it refers to judgment, it refers to justice, it refers to these, these other things. Because vengeance, what is vengeance? Vengeance is basically it's exacting the punishment or getting some kind of retribution for a wrong that was committed against a person, right? When vengeance is carried out, that's why this whole chapter here, Psalm 94, is really talking about these wicked people, people against God. He's saying, you know, how long, O oh Lord, how long um, shall the wicked triumph? Meaning, you know, these people, these wicked people are out, they're committing wicked acts, they're doing wrong, they don't care about God, and they're succeeding, right? And this is something that people look at today and you go, how is that possible? How is that going to happen? Why, why should these people, and you can look at like the famous rock stars, the Hollywood stars, whatever, people who live life of extreme sin, people who don't care about God, they want to do things their way, yet they're living and and doing well, right? Seemingly, at least on the outside, they look like, hey, they got everything going for them. They got all this money. They don't have to worry about anything. You know, they don't have to go, go do some hard work. They, they've got it made, right? And it seems like nothing bad even is even happening to them, right? And this is why it's important to understand vengeance because that very first verse is key. And this is, and this is going to be a primary application of the sermon. Vengeance belongs unto God, okay? It's not our place it's not our responsibility to, to go and make sure that every right, every wrong is right and that, and that every, you know, everything that people do wrong has been taken care of, okay? That's not our job. And ultimately, because we are not the judge of the earth, we are not the judge of everybody else's matters. God is the judge. And to whom judgment belongeth, which is God, He's also the one responsible for making sure that vengeance takes place, that there is a revenge, that there is a recompense or a payment. See, all these words are synonymous. Recompense, this, this payment, uh, vengeance, they, they all have very, very similar, not the same meanings. Because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're making up for something. You're, you're giving the reward. The, 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 um, and reward isn't always positive, right? Reward is something that you receive as a result of your actions. So sometimes a reward can be good. Sometimes a reward can be bad. Um, it's what you're given as a result of what you do. And vengeance is basically the same thing. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter number 35. But in Genesis 4 here, we see the first, pretty much the first time vengeance is brought up, and it's involved to Cain. You remember Cain and Abel, right? Cain rose up and he slew his brother. He killed his brother Abel. And he didn't have a good reason for it at all. I mean, he, he basically was a murderer. He killed him in cold blood. He didn't like what he was saying. He didn't like that Abel was, was righteous before God and Cain wasn't, and he killed him. Okay? And in Genesis 4, 13, I'll read this for you. The Bible says, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And this is right after God says, Okay, Cain, you're going to be a vagabond in the earth. you got to go. You know, you, you know this, is, this is the punishment, and this is prior to God instituting the death penalty on murder. See, back in the Old Testament, before the flood, the death penalty was not given by God to, on people who commit murder. But after the flood, that's when he instituted the death penalty and said, okay, you know, whoever sheds blood 
by man shall his blood be shed. He's saying that this, this is going to put an end to this. But anyway, this is kind of a side issue. So Cain gets punished here, and in verse 14 it says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So Cain's saying, look, People don't like me now because I've, you know, because I've mur I'm a murderer. And he says, anyone who finds me now, they're gonna, they're gonna want to kill me. They're gonna want to take my life. You know, they're gonna want to punish me. And he says, you've already punished me. We you know why. You know, I'm gonna be now. People are gonna try to kill me. So, basically, God says, okay, anybody that kills Cain, he says, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So here we see a pretty good understanding of what vengeance is, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a punishment. It's going to be something that's given out if somebody does wrong and inflicts violence against Cain, right? Someone goes and kills him and take his life away from him. They would be committing a crime. It's not their job. It's not their role to, to make sure that, well, no, I don't think that judgment is fair, God. I'm going to take his life because he took Abel's life, right? If, so, if you were to do that and say, I don't, I don't trust God's judgment, he says, no. Anyone who, who kills Cain now, vengeance will be taken on him in sevenfold. He's saying, look, it's going to be seven times worse. It's going to be that much more. It's going to be extreme punishment if anyone comes and, and, and kills Cain. And he puts a mark on him so people know, hey, this is Cain. You know, like you're not allowed to kill him. And I mean, really, they're not allowed to kill anybody. But he's saying, in this case, he said, vengeance will be taken on him. Now, if you're in Numbers 35... We're going to start reading verse 18. See, God has ordained a system of human government for judgment to be made and the appropriate vengeance to be taken. So we see vengeance is basically just, just a giving out of the punishment for a crime. That's essentially what vengeance is. And um, today we have more, more associated with vengeance of like a feeling of like, almost like a hatred type of thing. Like, oh man, I'm going to get vengeance on that guy. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. It's, but it's not just an emotional thing, right? Taking vengeance on someone. It's, it's something that's just, hey, you're righting a wrong. You're, 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 you're giving out this, this punishment that needs to be given out. So here we see in Numbers 35, we're going to see a little bit of, um, of God's human government that he has ordained to, to exact vengeance on people. Okay, let's start reading verse number 18 in Numbers 35. The Bible says, or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. So we explain here who's a murderer, right? Basically, if you, if you kill someone, if you, if you take a weapon or a weapon of wood or whatever, and you kill somebody with it, he says, you're a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. So here we see in number 35, there's a death penalty. Look, if you kill somebody, if you murder somebody, it's not an accident. There's all kinds of different laws. You can read through the whole Testament. You read through Numbers, you read through Leviticus, and see that, like, you know, when deaths happen accidentally, that's like manslaughter today. God does not have the death penalty on that. It's a different type of crime. But when you, like, if you were to, to get in a fight with someone, and then, like, you pick up a rock, or you pick up some other weapon, and you just, like, and you just kill them, right? And, it's, and we're not talking about self-defense, but, I mean, you just, like, you start fighting with somebody, you get in a fight, and then you just end up killing them. Hey, you're a murderer, is what he's saying. And that's what he says here. You know, if you smite him with the, with the, with an hand weapon of wood, where would he may die? And he dies a murderer. Look at verse 19. It says, The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. Now, here we see someone that's called the revenger of blood. Now, that word revenge, right, is basically is, comes from the same word as vengeance. The revenger of blood, and you'll read a lot about the revenger of blood in the Old Testament. The revenger of blood is somebody who would be like um, someone really close to the person who got killed, right? So if someone, if, you're, if your wife died, right, if someone killed your wife, you would be the revenger of blood as the husband. Or if your brother or your sister got killed. Right? Something, something like that. Like, like you would be, if you're, the, if you're the closest one to him, you would be the revenger of blood. You would be the one, because obviously it impacts you the most, this person's life being taken away, you would be the revenger of blood. And the Bible points out that, hey, there's a revenger of blood. It says, and that person himself shall slay the murderer. Now, 
I believe there's a good reason for this that God gives for the person themselves being like the executioner of the punishment. Now, there's lots of punishments in the Bible where the people will generally, you know, stone someone with stones or, you know, and obviously it all happens legally. It all, it all happens in a, in a sense where somebody's a judge, right? And they're going to judge and, and find out all the details and make sure that this person really committed a crime. We're not talking about mobs here. We're not talking about someone just taking justice completely into their own hands. But what they're doing is when the sentence is carried out and they say, okay, you're a murderer. You killed this person. They're saying that the revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. It makes it really personal. See, to, in today's society, the way that we even do, like when the very rare occurrences there even is a death penalty anymore, it's really far removed from everything and everybody. And in a way that's dangerous, because taking somebody's life and murder is, is a big deal. That's why, like, we're detached from wars. We're detached from all this violence that, like, if you had to experience and see this stuff for yourself personally, you'd be a lot less likely to want to continue with that and think that it's a good idea. Like, these politicians who have never been in the military... And they make sure that their kids never get sent off to war. Hey, yeah, they're first. They're going to be voting on these bills. Yeah, we should get our troops over in this other country. And we need to be putting them out there. And we need to be policing the world. And we need to be doing all this stuff and putting these kids in harm's way when they themselves won't go and do it. Yeah, it's a lot easier to make those decisions when you're not the one going to be a part of it. When you're not the one putting your life on the line. When you're not the one, you know, that could possibly get killed. And in a similar sense... Carrying out these judgments is a big deal. Now, for one, vengeance is important that it comes to pass. A right recompense, that, that justice happens. It's important for us as human beings to know that, hey, this person does not just get away with these things that are done. I mean, if someone murders your family member, right, that they're not just going to get off the hook, that causes so many more problems. There is part of it, there's a healing process when you are wrong, when things do, when bad things happen to you or people violate you, part of the healing process, one of the things that helps you out a lot is when you see the, the perpetrator getting punished for it. That will help you grow. I, I know a lot of times, and, and this is real common, I've read this, I mean, I don't know personally firsthand, but I don't think I need to. You read about, um, you know, women who are violated or molested or raped or whatever, you know, they have these things happen to them. And obviously it's a, it's a big impact when someone violates you in that way. And, and you know, a lot of women have these, these, these thoughts and these feelings of like, um, you know, kind of putting the blame on themselves when it doesn't happen to the other person. You know, these people just get away with it. And maybe, she, maybe she'll try to, to bring it up and say, hey, this, per, you know, this person took advantage. And, and, you know, this happens a lot with people who are famous with pastors, with other people to say, oh, no, no, yeah, you're crazy, you're just trying to slant, you know, and, and they're not listening. And it has a lot more damage to that person when the person who's responsible for those actions does not get punished at all. It does a lot more mental and emotional anguish on that person to see this person who violated them just walking around and nothing, and, and, and not even that, in many cases, they're embraced, People love them. I mean, this happens so many times. It happens in families. Little children get, get violated by some other family member, and no one wants to believe that it's true. And, and this person is just, just walking around, and that, and that child or that person, whoever's violated, has to witness this and watch that person. Just, just nothing happens to them. And that's gonna, that does a lot of damage to the individual. Because, for one, you're, you, you start questioning, well, you know, what, this isn't right. What's going on? And then you start to question because nothing's happened to that person. You know, a lot of times people start to think, you know, everyone else thinks that person's so great. Then you start thinking, well, what did I do? And they start putting the blame on themselves for something that they never should have been putting the blame on. Well, no, that person's wicked. They need to be put to death. And, and you know, in, in this case, where you're talking here, the revenger of blood should be the first one to do it. That's going to help in their healing process of saying, look, He's been violated in a way you can't take back. If someone murders your family member, you can't bring that person back. 
Now, um, again, I'm not saying that we should just take matters into our own hands. And that's not what the Bible's teaching here at all. It's not just your job to go and just make sure that justice is, is paid for. God is, the, God is in charge of that, but he's also ordained a human government, a system, so that, so that these crimes can be punished and they can be punished appropriately. Now, as I was saying earlier, you know, when people pick up stones and cast it at that person, yeah, you know, an adulterer, for example, was supposed to be killed by people picking up rocks and throwing it to him. You know, again, after they're found guilty, the evidence is there, yes, this person is guilty of this crime. When everybody's involved in that, for one, it gives you a proper hatred of that sin. When you actually have to carry out a sentence, you're going to have a different view of that sin. It's not, you're not going to be looking at it as, oh, well, it's really not that big of a deal. And see, it kind of spreads as a cancer. And that's what's happening today is that, you know, so many people seem to be caught up in these sins of adultery and, and, and whatever. I mean, the sodomy and homosexuality and it just being accepted. And it's not a big deal. Hey, if we were carrying out these sentences and people actually had to pick up rocks and, like, be a part of that execution of a person... That would, for one, have an impact on you as a person, a big impact, and saying, wow, if I actually have... I mean, it's one thing to see this stuff on paper. It's one thing to read this in the Bible, right? It's one thing to say, oh, okay, well, yeah, I agree with that. It's another thing to actually be a part of that. It has a stronger impact on you as a person when you are, when you are actually taking part of this and saying, no... Like, really, this is what we need to do. We need to actually kill this person, and you are part of that process. That will give you the proper perspective on, on that. I believe that's why God did it the way that he did it and, and made out these, the, the carrying out of these sentences in this way because it will have that much more of an impact where you think, wow, this is, this is real. I mean, there's real consequences for these actions, and I need to hate this sin because, for one, you don't want to see anyone else have to suffer for that and deal with that and go through that. But, um, but also, other people are going to see that, and when it's more of a public thing, it's going to hit home, too. Yeah, I've mentioned this before. I mean, you're going to think twice about adultery or about other things where God ordained a death penalty. If you've already seen, like, like in the town square, I mean, this person got executed for this, hey, maybe I'll think twice. When it's more a part of your, of your, of your you know, I don't want to say daily life, because hopefully something like this wouldn't be happening daily, but... You know what I mean? I mean, it, when, when the example is set forth and it's public and it's saying this is, what, this is how God views this type of sin and this is how we view this type of sin and we're not going to take it and we're going to follow. And I believe that's why God has, has kind of ordained this method of saying, well, the revenger of blood himself shall say the murderer. And it's going to be a, you know, it's basically a public thing or, or in other sentences where everyone's going to pick up stones and, and kill that person. Um, Anyways, let's, let's get back on topic here. Let's, um, I'm going to skip over the rest of what I had on Numbers 35. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read a little bit more. Because um, he gives this whole, this whole section of Scripture about the revenger of blood. And it says... Um, Yeah, it says, I'll just keep reading this for you in 24. It says, Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. So the congregation, people are going to decide, right? There's a jury. People are going to hear the case. They're going to, they're going to judge. It says, And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the Holy Oil. So this is saying if the congregation finds that the person wasn't a murderer, like it was just maybe manslaughter as an accident. They're saying, okay, in this situation, the person who, who, who committed the manslaughter, the person who killed the other guy, he has to go and live in another city because, because of the revenge of blood, because of this person's family, they're still going to be upset. And God knows this. Hey, you still killed them. You know, and, and he doesn't want people to have to just face that person all the time. And, and there's a lot more likelihood of, of violence breaking out because... This guy killed your relative. This guy killed your family member. So you're saying, okay, manslaughter, he's not, he's not going to be guilty in the sense that, you know, any punishment is going to be exacted against him. Like, he's not going to have his life taken against him. But he has to go to this other city. And he has to stay there until 
um, until the chief priest dies, or the high priest um, dies, and then he could come back to his hometown. But, um, and then it also says, it says, but if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of the blood. So he's saying, look, if that guy that commit the manslaughter goes into another, you know, he's, he's sent out to his other city, he has to stay there. If, if the revenger of blood, the person who's, you know, the most responsible for the person that was killed, if he finds him just, just out and he's not in that city and he ends up killing him, then that per if he kills him, he's not found guilty. He says, look, because he should have stayed in that city. That was the city that was his safe place. That was where he would be given the assurance that nothing would happen to him because of, because of the life that he took. But if he decides, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to travel, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, or whatever, and he runs across the Revenger of Blood, the Revenger of Blood kills him, then he says, that guy's not guilty for taking his life because he should have just stayed where he was. And um, anyways, that's a, that could be a whole other sermon just on this one topic. But you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And um, another point I want to bring out, see, God has ordained this... this um, the human government to carry out sentence. God has ordained a human government for us for, for vengeance to take place. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's very clear that we as Christians are not supposed to take other Christians to law. Okay, even though this human government's in place, we're gonna see here a little bit about vengeance and about, about the law and how we ought to deal with other Christians. Now the law is there, it needs to be there, you know, to handle disputes and to arbitrate and for judges to judge righteously. But we're going to see here what, what the Bible's talking about with just matters among, among Christians, right? And um, look at verse number one. It says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Now, I like that first word. He's like, dare. I mean, do you even dare to do this? Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? He says, Do you not know? That the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So he's saying, look, why is it that you're going to the world, to the unsaved, to the heathen to judge you? He's like, we're going to judge, the saints are going to judge the angels. The saints are going to judge the world. God has given us that, that you know, um, responsibility where we're going to be judges. He's saying you can't even judge among the smallest matters. So he's saying like, you know, let's say someone, um, someone steals from you in church. Or, or you go and you make an agreement with someone and you're going to do work for them and, you know, it's understood they're going to pay you this amount of money and then you get done with the work and they're saying, oh, uh, you know, I don't really have the money now. And they don't pay you, right? Let's say someone wrongs you like that in church. Well, the Bible's saying, look, if you got a matter like that, don't sue that person and bring them to law. He's saying don't bring them to law against the unbelievers. If you got a problem with someone, first you just go to them and try to deal with it. And if they don't listen to you, then you bring it to the church because he's saying the church can judge righteously, right? You're not, you don't want to trust the world to have righteous judgment because who knows what their morals are, where they get their authority from. If someone's not a believer, if someone's not a believer in Jesus Christ, if they're not saved, if they don't believe the Bible, then what in the world are they basing their judgment on? And do you really want to take someone to law and say, okay, well, you know, here's my case, and you're going you're gonna to bring that before these people, and they're going to be judging what's right and wrong? He's saying, no, that's what the church is for. God's word will help you to, to decide, and you can have people in the church that are able to judge these matters. He says, that's where you ought to bring it. It says in verse 6, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So he's rebuking him here and saying, look, you're at a fault. When you take your brother in Christ to law, when you go to court against another believer, when you just bring him out into this world and go into this world judgment, he says, there's a fault among you. 
because you go to law one with another, he's saying, why wouldn't you rather just take the wrong? Just suffer yourself to be defrauded. Just allow it to happen. Say, look, God will take care of the judgment. You don't need to be worried, especially about the monetary thing, right? I mean, it's things, I mean, someone cheats you out of some money or ruins your property or whatever it may be. Hey, look, there's nothing wrong with trying to get that settled with the person. But do it the right way is what he's saying, first of all. Don't just sue that person and bring him to law. Let it be handled in the church. The church can handle these matters. You say, oh, but the government doesn't give the church authority to judge. Look, the government doesn't have to give the church authority to judge in these matters. God has given the church authority to judge in these matters, and that ought to be enough for us to say, okay, well, God's saying that we're going to judge the angels, so if I have a problem with another Christian, then I'm going to bring it to the church. And I don't care what the stupid government has to say about the way we ought to handle this dispute. We're going to let the church deal with it. Because that's the way that the Bible says that we ought to do it. And he's also just saying, look, and, and besides that, why, why, do you even, why do you even care? Why don't you just take it? Just look. Look at all the things that Jesus Christ, as an example, went through for us. Look at all the things that he suffered that were wrong. Did he deserve any of the whippings and beatings and mockings and, spit and, and just, just all the lies that were told about him? No. But did he make it a point to just make sure they're all going to pay for what they did? No. And see, here's the, here's the thing. The reason why we don't have to worry about that is because God will take care of it. And we know that God is a God of justice. Okay, and we're going to see that here um, real quick. Now, one, one other point I want to make, because this just came up. I was already prepared to, to preach this sermon before this happened. But just this week, there's a good example, a perfect example of what's going on with this you know, brother going to law with brother and trying to exact vengeance themselves. Instead of going, instead of dealing with it within the church, um, for all of, for anyone who's seen that that documentary, New World Order Bible versions, you may or may not recall there is a there's a a nonprofit organization that's mentioned in there called Bibles International, okay, and they were referenced in a positive light, saying, hey, this you know these people are doing a good thing, they're getting the Bible out to these different languages and whatever. Well, apparently this week they threatened to sue Paul Wittenberger, which is the producer of, of that film, because I guess they use, they say they use the majority text to do the translations from. Now for you guys that aren't necessarily familiar with, with the different terminology and the different Greek manuscripts, basically the majority text is a different collection of Greek manuscripts than the Textus Receptus. The Textus Receptus is the Greek um, Manuscripts that the that the King James Bible is based on, okay. They this come this organization, Bibles International, used to use the Texas Receptus as their source documents when they do their translating into other languages. Apparently, at some point within the past few years or whatever, they they changed their stance and now they use the majority text, which is, which is a different collection, which is different Greek manuscripts that they base it off of, and. Because of that, they, I guess, apparently maybe they don't want to be associated with the King James Only movement. They don't want to be associated with this, so they just decided to threaten to sue the producer unless he recalls every single DVD that's gone out, which I don't know, has probably been, who knows how many thousands are already out, right? Logistically, it's just ridiculous to even say this. And then to change the film to update it to where they're not mentioned in it at all. And it's like, first of all, they were put in a positive light. They, they weren't, they weren't bad-mouthed in a documentary at all. They were actually just, just promoted. But second of all, why in the world are you threatening to sue in the legal system a brother in Christ? This goes smack in the face of what we just read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And, this, and the reason I even bring it up is because it's a perfect example being played out of what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 6. Look, if they have a matter against another brother, but and, and regardless of whether it's legitimate or not, okay, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna go there because I think it's illegitimate, but it doesn't matter, right? They have an issue with someone else, right? Someone in, in any issue is pretty, usually gonna be wrong, and someone's gonna be right, okay? Regardless, if you have a matter with someone, whether you're in the right or whether you're in the wrong, you ought not to be taking it to the to the world to say, hey, judge this matter for us. It needs to be taken care of in the church. But I'm gonna. Um, Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. 
And we're going to see very, very clearly here in Romans 12. We saw in, in, the, first, in, in um, the first scripture that we read that vengeance belongs unto God. Right? We saw that in Psalm 94. Romans chapter 12 is going to explain the same exact thing, except a little bit more clearly for us. Look at Romans 12. Look at verse number 16. Romans 12. The Bible says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Recompense is just repaying, right? Don't do evil to someone that does evil to you. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, so because of this, because of the fact, he's saying, look, don't avenge yourselves, Give place unto wrath, for it is written, the reason why you, should, you don't need to avenge yourselves, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. If we know that God is going to repay, if we know that God is going to hold people responsible for their actions, then we don't need to, to worry about it. We don't need to deal with it. And here's the thing, back to the, my example of, of you see these, you know, these, these stars, these people living in wickedness, you see these people doing everything that's wrong, everything against God, yet they seem to be succeeding. You know what? In the end... They won't be, because hell is a real place. So when you look at someone and you can say, man, that's unjust. There's no justice in this world. What's going on? And you look at people or, or the, the, the perverts that get off and, and, and they seem like everything's just going fine. Why aren't they getting in trouble? You know what? God knows what's going on. And in the end, God will take care of it. Okay. When a person dies and they burn in hell for an eternity, they didn't get away with anything. Even though in our eyes we might look at it and it seems like they get away, they didn't get away with anything. God sees and God is a God of vengeance. He's a God of justice. He makes sure that these things will happen. That's what in our, in our memory passage, Galatians chapter 6, he says that, um, you know, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God makes sure that happens. God is the one that, that is the revenger. God is the one that will avenge himself. So then what are we supposed to do? If God is the one that revenges, then, then what are we supposed to do? Look at verse number 20 of Romans 12. He says, therefore, so because of this, because vengeance belongs unto God, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. That might not be the first thing that comes to your mind when your enemy is hungry. <laughs> You're like, good, starve, you know. <laughs> He's saying, no, that's not the attitude that we ought to have. He say, hey, look, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Look at this. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. By having the right attitude, by, by being loving, by extending the mercy, by, by, by not holding a grudge, by being able to say to your enemies, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do good to you. Look at verse 21. It says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. By overcoming that evil with good, he's saying by you doing that, God sees that, and that makes what they have done so much worse than you're heaping coals of fire on their head. Because if you think about this, right, if you're nothing but good to someone, yet they continually wrong you, and they continually use you, and they keep on doing bad things to you, it's that much worse than if you were doing bad things back to them, because then you have this back and forth thing going, say, oh, well, well you've wronged me, and now I'm going to wrong you, and, you know, there's, there's, there's less um, punishment that needs to be given to that person if you're perpetuating the, 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 the problem. But if you're just good, if you're just saying, okay, you've done me wrong, I forgive you, and you, and you, do, and you just say, you know what, you know, you're hungry, you're some food. You see, you see someone else down on their luck, the same person maybe that had done you wrong before. You know, and, and this would be a real life example of something that would happen is, you know, someone's done you wrong. Let's take an example of someone, someone stiffing you for work that you've done, right? They don't pay you. And then later on, now they've lost their job. Now they're hungry. Now they're looking for something, right? Now, now they actually need help. You could just say, yeah, you guess you shouldn't have stiffed me then, huh? You know, God's taking care of you for that. <laughs> but that's not the right attitude to have. The Bible's saying, no, 
give them food. Help them out. Now, if you're worried that, that you still haven't been you know, paid back for yet, hey, God's going to take care of that, and you being nice to that person is just, I mean, if anything, it's just going to heap coals of fire on their head because they shouldn't have, have done that to you, especially when you're going to be so nice and so forgiving and so loving to them. And that's what he's saying. That's, that's our job. See, we shouldn't get all hung up on vengeance. And this is the main theme of the sermon, right? Because people are wrong. I mean, it's going to happen. It happens to all of us in our life. People will do you wrong. People are going to do wrong to you, but we need to trust and have faith that God sees what is going on. He knows the score. He knows what people have done, even if no one else in the world does, and you can't prove anything to anybody. God sees all. God knows all. God will make sure that the right justice has the right judgment happens. He won't let these things go undone. The Bible says um, in Proverbs 20, 22, he says, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. See, God's the one. See, in all things of our life, God wants us relying on him. In all things. Whether it be for our salvation. We can't make it heaven. He wants us to rely on him. Whether it be we have sickness, we have other things. Hey, bring it to God, pray to God, rely on him. Whether it be someone's done wrong to us. Hey, we need help in this matter. Hey, rely on God. God wants us as his children to be dependent on him. Now, it doesn't mean don't go out and work and do all these other things that he's told us to do. But he's saying, look, God wants us dependent on him. And, um, oh man, I'm going to have to skip this point. This is going way longer than I thought. There's so much to, to deal with with this subject of vengeance. But um, let's, let's keep moving on here because... There's one other point I want to make about vengeance, and turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. As I was mentioning earlier, there's a, there's a certain satisfaction to be had when the person who has wronged you gets what they deserve. And that could be part of the healing process. Now, we are not necessarily the ones that are supposed to be, you know, having a grudge or a bad attitude against people, but it still is helpful when you see the person get what they deserve for you. I mean, it, it's, it's a sense of justice being carried out. And there's nothing wrong with looking for God to bring vengeance upon his enemies. Okay? When someone's an enemy of God, there's nothing wrong with you to look for, for vengeance to be brought upon that person. The Bible says in Nahum 1, 2, it says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. But then it goes on to say, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Acquit is acquitted means, you know, he's not just going to give them a free bet. He's not going to say that they're off the hook. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds of the dust of his feet. So he's saying, look, God is revengeous and he's furious. God's going to take vengeance on his adversaries, on his enemies. But he's also slow to anger, which is one of the reasons why you see people who are extremely wicked, God-hating people kind of going through their life without have, seeing anything happen to them. God is slow to anger and he's great in power, it says, and he's, but he's not going to quit at all the wicked. So you don't have to worry, even though it seems like they might be getting away with something, they're not. He's not at all going to acquit the wicked. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at verse number 4. Starting in verse number 4, the Bible reads, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now, what this is saying, you know, verse 4, we start reading that he's writing to people that are being persecuted. They're suffering. 
They're going through tribulations. They're enduring all this stuff because people are attacking them for their faith in God. And, and he's saying that, look, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So he's explaining to them, you know, it's, it's kind of helped to, to strengthen them and build them up. While you're going through all these problems, while you're going through all this suffering and the tribulation, he says in verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. He wants them to, to be at rest with what's happening. He doesn't want you to be worried and troubled with the, with the troubles that they're going through and the persecution that they're facing. Why? Why does he say rest with us? He says, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glorious power of Satan. You can take rest in the fact that you know that, that when Jesus Christ comes back, he said, these, look, these people are going to be punished with everlasting destruction. These enemies of God, the enemies of God that are attacking you, you know, the, these children of Satan, the children of Belial that are coming out and attacking you because you're promoting God and you're, and you're trying to do what's right. He's saying, don't worry about it. Take rest with us. We have rest in this, in this matter already. You don't need to be, to be concerned or fearful or, or anything like that because God's going to set the record straight. And, um, man, I got, I got so much stuff in here. I got to skip so much. <laughs> look, at, um, look at Psalm 58. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 58 because we're going to see here we're going to see here people rejoicing and being happy over this judgment that's carried out. And it's like, it's, again, it's one of these things that might be kind of hard to, to see or to recognize that um, when you think about God pouring out his wrath on people, it's a, I mean, it's a scary thing, right? You think about the book of Revelation. You think about the water being turned into blood and, and just fire and brimstone raining down from heaven and people being scorched and, and just, you know, it says the Bible is gnawing their, their, their tongues for pain. Like, like they're, just, they're, they're just in such pain and agony and anguish and stuff. Yet, people are going to be rejoicing. The saints are going to be rejoicing when that happens. When God actually carries out his vengeance against the wicked. against the people. Because these are the people that, are, that, that have done extremely wickedly. And that have not received Christ as their Savior, they're, they've gone against God, and they're going to be receiving what, what they deserve. But that's because God's going to pour it out. Psalm 58, we're going to read, we're going to read um, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stop at their ear. Now, again, I'm going to pause here real quick just to point out, he's talking about people who are really wicked. Okay? He, he's making a point to say, look, these, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You know, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. So we're talking about the really wicked people here. Not just your average day, maybe even just unsaved person, right? This is, this is talking about really wicked people. He says, um, verse 5, Which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Now, those are some pretty strong words. It's some pretty strong cursing against these people, saying, God, break their teeth out of their face. This is something that, you know, the Psalm of the that, um, you know, David wrote down the psalm, but, it, but it's, it's God's word, right? This is, this is part of the Bible. This is God's word here. 
of this curse against wicked people. For God to, to um, break the teeth out of their mouth, he says, let them melt away. And um, as a snail which melteth, let all of them just melt away. Like, like these are some pretty vivid um, and, uh, descriptions here he's given of you know, the untimely birth of a woman that they may not see the sun. He's saying, look, just destroy these people. Let them melt away. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with the whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Verse 10 says, the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, which means truthfully. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. So the reason why is, look, the righteous are going to rejoice when they see God's vengeance carried out. When they see the wicked just, just receive God's vengeance and, and just, just unmercifully just pouring out wrath on these, these extremely wicked people, he says that um, the saints are going to rejoice. They're going to be happy. You and I will rejoice when, when the extremely wicked people in this world get what's coming to them. When they get God's wrath. And it says, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Now, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty strong statement. Saying that you're going to be so happy, you know, the saints are going to be so happy, he's going to wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Just so rejoicing that they are destroyed. Now, there's a false idea, a false concept out there that God loves everybody all the time. And that's not true. The Bible says that the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. The Bible says, now, the Bible does say that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it says he loved. At one point, God loves everybody in this world. But there gets a point with some people where God stops loving them. And that is the truth. And that's, you know, when they become this, this extremely wicked reprobate, right? Back to that sermon I preached last week on reprobates and people that, that do these things, they cross the line with God. And there's a reason why, and ultimately, anyone who doesn't receive Christ, I mean, when they go to hell, hell is a place of wrath. It's a place of anger. Do you really think, I've had someone say this to me before, and I was just like, you don't even know what love is. They think that God still loves the people that are burning in hell. God doesn't love those people. If he did, he wouldn't be torturing them and tormenting them forever. It's a place of God's wrath. His wrath, the hell's flames are kindled by God's wrath, his anger, his hatred. Okay? God has this aspect to him that, that people need to understand and need to realize. And that's why vengeance belongs unto him because he's going to make sure the right punishment happens. Now, As much as God is extremely loving and merciful and great and how awesome heaven's going to be is the exact polar opposite of hell, right? God loves you so tremendously and, and you know, is giving you a free gift of eternal life and everything else and, and how, how great that's going to be. He has a polar opposite with hell. And um, it's, it's just like anything. You can't have a positive without a negative. People who think that God is all positive do not have the proper view of God. Now, again, I mean, God's not all negative either, right? I mean, of course not. He's, he is extremely merciful, loving, and, and gracious, and does so many great things for us. But I think it's because of that, because of how good he is when people reject God, after all of his goodness, and after he can't do literally like anything more for us, besides a hand salvation on a silver platter, here you go. I suffered everything for you, and you still want to reject that? That's where God gets his anger from and his wrath. He says, look, this, this is deserving. And I think we'll probably have a better understanding of that maybe after we pass away when we're, we're done in this world, we don't have the sinful flesh to just to really just, just be able to rejoice in the fact that, okay, we understand that like, you know, sin is extremely, is extremely sinful and, um, and, and understand God a little bit better so that we can just just rejoice in it. And just rejoice in the fact that we know that, hey, God is a God that judges the earth. He's righteous in his judgment. 
He's extremely merciful, and because of that, he has every right to be extremely harsh, if you want to say that word, which it's not harsh. I mean, it's, it, that's the way God made it, and he designed it, and he's, everything he does is righteous, but um, to have that type of response to people and have them burning in hell forever, he's righteous in doing that. Now, the last point, real quickly, is the, the day of the Lord is a day of vengeance. The day of the Lord hasn't happened yet. The day of the Lord is coming up. The Bible refers to the day of the Lord many times. Um, especially in the book of Revelation, but through, through other books as well. Um, it says in Isaiah 34, 8, you don't have to turn there, it says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Basically, the day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ comes back, there's the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. I'm, and I'll have to preach a sermon on this. It's real interesting. The day of Christ is always, is always referred to in a positive light, and, it, and that's referring to the, resur to the resur to second resurrection, where basically it's the rapture, where we're going to be raptured out of this world. That's the day of Christ. The day of the Lord is always a negative event. It's a negative time. It's where God's going to pour out his wrath on this earth. But what's interesting is that that day occurs on the same day. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord happen on the same day. The same day that we are taken out of this world, that we're raptured out of here, is the same day that God is going to start pouring out his wrath on the world. And... Um, that is when everything is basically going to come to a head. When God's just going to say, enough. You know, when the wickedness goes on. Because there's going to be extreme wickedness. And you think about, he likens, in Matthew 24 and other places, he likens the, the, the events of the rapture and us being taken out of this world the, and the, the onset of the, of the day of the Lord to the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And in both of those stories, in the days of Noah... The Bible says that, that, you know, wickedness was just rampant, right? I mean, people were violating each other. There was violence filled the earth, which is why God decided, you know what? It's just, there's so much violence, I'm going to wipe everything out. And that's when he sent the flood, right? But Noah was righteous in God's eyes, so he saved Noah alive. But the whole rest of the world, the Bible says the world was filled with violence. It had gotten to a point where it was so bad that God's solution was just, we're going to, we're going to, Clear the slate and start over again. That was in the days of Noah. The days of Lot, right? How wicked was Sodom? Where these angels come into town, they go into Lot's house. Lot says, no, 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 you want to stay in the street, come into my house. It basically is saying that like the whole city surrounded his house. I mean, there's just all these wicked men of the city, young and old, it says, surrounded his house and just wanted to violate in the most perverted way these angels that came in to Lot's house. That is how out of control things had gotten in that city and how wicked. I mean, it's one thing to have like one or two people in a city that are like that, that are just extremely wicked, depraved, you know, just just total animal, brute beasts, you know, made to be taken and destroyed. But like to have that many, to just have this huge mob of people just... just willing to tear your house down and get to these people, like, that's really wicked. And that's the point that Sodom had gotten to then when God decided to rain fire and brimstone down. I mean, Abraham was pleading with God and just saying, God, what if there's ten righteous people in that whole city? Ten! Just ten people that are righteous. Will you spare it? And God said, I'll spare it for ten people. There were not ten righteous people in that whole city. So, the wickedness that came before the flood, the wickedness that was abounding in the times of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, we're going to see wickedness in this earth right before Jesus Christ comes back. That's going to be, I, I believe, equivalent to, to both of those scenarios where, where it's, just, it's just really bad. And, and we're kind of ramping up, and it seems like we're, we're, we're getting snowball effect with the wickedness in this country and throughout the world of the acceptance of, of everything that's wicked. And just, and just it's, it's just becoming so much more and more, um, just, just so much worse than it ever has been. It seems to be accelerating more and more. And that's why I believe that, that Jesus Christ coming back is going to happen soon because of the amount of wickedness that is ramping up. But that day is going to be a day of vengeance. Because things are going to be so bad, God's just going to lay it straight, and that's when, when he's going to pour out all his wrath on the earth. And, um, you know, of course, the Antichrist will be in charge, and he's going to be Antichrist. He's anti-God.
He's going to be doing everything possible against God and um, going out and making war with the saints and all that. But um, my last scripture, I'll just read this for you. Isaiah 35, 4 says, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. This is something that we need to remember. So as things get worse, as the trials and the tribulations get worse in our day and age, as wickedness abounds and, and is rampant, be strong and fear not. God is going to come and save us. When the Antichrist comes into power, if it happens in our lifetime, if it happens while we're still alive on this earth, and he's just waging war against Christians, against the saints, and he's out to kill you, be strong and fear not. He says, your God will come with vengeance. Not only is God going to come and save you, he's going to come and he's going to right every wrong that's been done to you for your faith in him. He's going to make sure that they pay for whatever it is that you have to go through. I mean, there's going to be people martyred. They're going to be martyred in, in probably some really bad ways. I, I mean, people have throughout history, you think about the different torture and things that have gone on. Hey, God's going to come. He's going to make sure that that all gets recompensed. God will take vengeance. So let's close with this. Um, it's not up to us to exact vengeance on people. God is ordained. Yes, God has ordained the, the yeah. earthly mechanism for justice, right? There's a current justice system that God's ordained. Now, our, our current justice system does not follow very well what God has ordained as far as justice is concerned. But we don't even have to worry about that. Even though our, our justice system is corrupt, and it doesn't, it doesn't judge the way that, God, that God's word judge, judges, we can take comfort knowing that God is a righteous judge. And that just because some other human, some, some lost people or whatever aren't able to judge righteously, he still can. So when someone does you wrong, don't take it upon yourself to, to say, well, no, I have to make sure that this, that, that person gets what's coming to them. No, it's the exact opposite. Be nice. Be, be kind to that person. You know, uh, treat your enemies well. In so doing, you get and, and if it's hard for you to do that, just remember it's going to be heaping coals of fire on their head. <laughs> so if someone does it wrong, you think, that's the best way that you can get back at them, okay, is to leave it in God's hands. Let God knows all the truth of every situation. You know, we don't always even know all, all of the different events that go on in all the different circumstances. God knows everything. Let him be the judge. Be, be, overcome evil with good is, is the whole point. And, and that will have such a great impact on other people as well. And hey, maybe even on that person that did you wrong. When they see you not doing what people normally do, and they see you overcoming the evil with good, that can have a big impact on, on that person's life as well. And maybe they will repent, and maybe they'll get right, maybe they'll get right with God. And that would be even better than, than whatever way they've done you wrong getting paid for, right? If, 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 a, if, a, if a sinner comes to repentance and, and gets saved, or even just someone who's already saved gets right with God and starts living a better life. I mean, that, that will have a big impact in the long run, uh, much more than whatever, whatever wrong has been done to you probably anyways. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please help us. It's not always easy, Lord, to, to have this type of an attitude. It's really, it's really an attitude that requires um, meekness and humility. Lord, help us to humble ourselves, to allow, allow you to just to take the judgment and have the proper faith that we need to understand that you are, the, you are a righteous judge and your judgment will be more righteous than ours anyways. Whether, whatever we think that a person needs to have happen to them because they've done us wrong, Lord, Help us to have the faith to just to just trust in you. Help us to, to follow these words of um, overcoming evil with good. And um, Lord, I pray that you would please just just um, give us the strength that we need and, and, the, and the faith that we need to trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.